What is up you guys, I'm Charbix today, I'm gonna be reacting to five strange disappearances in Vermont's mysterious Bennington Triangle. Now this is my top five to make freaking awesome videos, I haven't reacted to top fives in a little while now. And I'm not really sure what to expect, I mean, I, are you telling me there's a Bermuda Triangle in Vermont? Since when? Anyway, with that being said, I, I'm, I'm, I'm excited because I love the Bermuda Triangle, like it's, it's just all the mystery surrounding it, it's really intriguing, so you know, if there's one you know, in friggin' Vermont, that's double the awesome, or cool. <laughs> anyway, with that being said, the original link's in the description. Make sure you guys go subscribe to Top 5s. Without any further ado, let's begin. Candy time. To look at Bennington County, situated in the southwestern US state of Vermont, you could be forgiven for assuming it's just another picturesque New England locale, nestled alongside Glastonbury Mountain, which forms part of the Green Mountain National Forest. The 275 mile long Long Trail, which runs through the length of Vermont, passes over the peak of Glastonbury Mountain, and is a mecca for hikers who come to marvel over the breathtaking landscape. Wait, so people come here to hike? Whenever people go hiking, you know, a, a certain amount of people every year would probably get go missing. Like, that's almost guaranteed. Because people do stupid things, people make bad decisions, they go off trail, you know, they fall, and no one can find them, and there you go. It's a beautiful and slightly isolated region that incorporates the ghost town of Glastonbury, which in the 1800s was a thriving centre for logging and charcoal production, but at the last count, now has a population of just eight. Eight? Eight people live in a town? That's not a town, okay? That's like two houses. <laughs> that's, that's two houses, okay? Yet, this serene region is home to a series of bizarre disappearances that occurred between 1945 and 1950, none of which have been solved. 45 and 1950? That's almost, what, back at the end of World War II? Or sufficiently explained. Midi Rivers. On November the 12th, 1945, Midi Rivers, a 74-year-old local guide and hunter, vanished whilst escorting a party of four men back from a hunting expedition along the Long Trail. Wait, so this guy was just escorting these people? He was walking with them and then all of a sudden he was gone? Midi, who had been walking slightly ahead of the group, was reportedly last seen at approximately 4pm, heading towards an area called Hal Hollow Brook. Assuming that Midi would be waiting for them by the time they reached their campsite, the men were slightly surprised to find no sign of him upon their return. Although initially, they were unconcerned, no- How far ahead was he? Like a, like a freaking mile ahead or something? Knowing ...that Midi possessed a sound knowledge of the terrain. But as time passed, they began to feel anxious and raise the alarm. A search party of 20 local firemen began to comb the area for signs of Midi, but to no avail. The search expanded over the following days, with 200 US Army recruits drafted in to assist- 200?! ...community in finding him. 200 freaking people were brought in to help find him. How far ahead was he?! After eight days of intense searching, there was still no indication of what could have happened to Midi. Search parties continued to look for him for a month, but he was never found, and the only indication that he had ever been in the area came in the form of an unused rifle cartridge, which was discovered lying at the bottom of Hal Hollow Brook. Why was it just there, and was unused too? That is a good mystery, I don't know, it's weird. but. Like, one thing, like, these are all from 1945 to 1950, I believe, right? It's not like it's a continuous problem, right? Like, this is within five years there was a span of disappearances. And if that's the case, it might have been someone lurking in the forest or something. Paula Jean Weldon. Paula, an 18-year-old student at Bennington College, went missing on December the 1st, 1946. She had a part-time job working the lunch shift at the on-campus dining hall. And after her shift ended, she returned to a dormitory and announced to her friends of her intention to explore the nearby Long Trail. She asked if any of them wanted to accompany her, but unfortunately- Who just does that? I, I'm gonna go friggin' explore some trail. Like, wh what? Who just does that? If you go out by yourself, yeah, who knows what could happen. Fortunately, they were either all busy or had no desire to join her. So Paula decided to go on her own. She changed into her trainers and an eye-catching bright red coat with a fur collar, but she packed no extra clothes, nor did she take any money or food with her. So it appeared 
she only planned to be out for a couple of hours. This is why it's good that video games exist now, because instead of exploring the world, kids are safe at home. Paula was observed by Danny Fager, a worker at a gas station located opposite the college entrance at 2.30pm. He claimed she sprinted up a small hill beside the college, only to walk back down again before heading down Route 67A towards Bennington. Paula then managed to hitch a lift with Louis Knapp, a local contractor who happened to be on his way home. She was hitchhiking. She was friggin' hitchhiking. There's a big problem right there. He dropped her off along Route 9, approximately 2.5 miles away from Long Trail. Whether she hitched another lift or walked the rest of the way is not known, but Paula reached Bigfoot Hollow at 3.45 p.m., where she was given directions by Ernie Whitman, an employee for the local newspaper. Okay, I was gonna say, I was gonna say, if, if the last person to see her alive was the person who picked her up, you know, hitchhiking, I think he might be a little bit, uh, suspicious, you know, but if she did make it somewhere else, where someone else saw her last, then that person, whoever saw her last is the most suspicious, let's just say that. Bennington Banner. He reportedly warned her about not wearing enough warm clothing for being outside in winter, and so close to sunset, which would occur at 4.20pm. This isn't a winter. Paula reportedly encountered a group of young hikers on her way along the trail, and asked them questions regarding the route. Then, after being observed at an area named Fay Fully Camp, she was never seen again. Never go to the woods alone, seriously. Paula's disappearance wasn't reported by her dorm mates that evening, as they had assumed she had returned to college and was studying in the library. However, when she failed to appear the next morning, her friends reported her missing to the head of college, and a large manhunt for Paula began. Yeah, you don't don't go friggin' hiking by yourself. It's always weird when people do that. You know crazy people around the world, right? If you go out hiking in the middle of a forest by yourself, you know, the, the odds of something happening to you are a lot greater when you're by yourself than when you have people around you, you know? So always go with someone. Or a dog, maybe. Because if you have a dog that'll protect you, that, that, that's one thing. The college suspended classes, so all students were given the opportunity to help look for her. And they were joined by a father, Archibald who was a well-renowned architect in his Archibald. home state of Connecticut. Archibald, that's a name you don't hear that often. He wielded his influence in order to get both the New York and Connecticut State Police to assist in searching for his daughter, which they were willing to do, especially given that Vermont had no state police force at this time. A $5,000 reward was posted for any information. $5,000, that's not much. I mean, most rewards are like $50,000 or $100,000 maybe cheap bastard relating to Paula's disappearance and the FBI were called in to help. Four weeks after searching both on foot and by air, Paula had still not been found. During the search, a waitress at a diner in Fall River, Massachusetts had claimed to serve a rather agitated young lady that matched the description of Paula. After receiving this information, Archibald took it upon himself to- Did they show her a picture? Because they had pictures. Look at all these freaking pictures back here. Did they show her, a, the, the, the waitress, a picture of the lady? You know, did they show her a picture? Because then she can confirm if it was or if it wasn't uh, her. And also, what is $5,000 in conversion to, like, nowadays? Because $5,000, you know, that's, that's still a decent amount of money. But back then, I'm pretty sure, like, 1945, that must be upwards of, like, $100,000 in today's money. Like, with inflation. In 1945. It's probably $100,000 or even more. Like, that's a lot of money. To investigate the lead, without telling the authorities involved, and he himself disappeared for a total of 36 hours. The police viewed his behavior as somewhat suspicious, and local opinion began to favor the idea that Paula's father could himself be a suspect. This notion was reinforced by reports that Paula had at some point fallen out with Archibald resulting in her decision to remain at Bennington College over Thanksgiving. So what What were you saying? He, he, the father? What? The daughter? What did he possibly have to gain from that? If anything, he just stands to lose everything. Rather than returning home. In turn, Paula's father proposed that she may have had a boyfriend that she planned on meeting, and insinuated that her unknown lover was at the heart of Paula's disappearance. Paula's father left Bennington on December the 16th, never to find out what lay behind the mystery of his daughter's disappearance. Throughout the following decade, a local man reportedly proclaimed that he knew Paula was dead, and that he had knowledge of where her body was located. 
I mean if you admit to knowing that information I think you might be the person who killed her. However, when escorted by police officers, he couldn't or didn't identify a site. Which- So he was doing it just for fame or just for the attention? Man, I tell you, crazy people are everywhere. Crazy people are everywhere. Contained any signs of human remains. And so, to this day, Paula's disappearance is a complete mystery. That's weird. And the weirdest thing is that it was between, you know, within like a five year span. I think the waitress who said that she served a girl who fits the description, I think she would have been the best lead. Why didn't you show them a picture of her to confirm if it was or wasn't her, you know? James Edward Tedford. Now this is a strange one. Exactly three years to the day after Paula went missing, on December the 1st, 1949, James Tedford, a World War II veteran, became the third person to vanish in the Bennington Triangle. James lived at a soldier's retirement home in Bennington and was returning there from visiting relatives in St. Albans. This was an arduous eight hour bus journey for James. So he was a soldier? In snowfall, this meant the trip took even longer. There were around a dozen other passengers on the bus and they all testified that James was on the vehicle for the whole duration of the journey. Or at least that's what they think. I mean, if you ride a bus, do you pay attention to everyone that's on the bus at all times? That's right, you don't. With some noting that they had seen him asleep in his seat at different stages throughout the trip. The passengers that remained on the bus until it reached Bennington claim they recall seeing James in his seat at the last stop prior to reaching Bennington. However, when the bus reached its terminal point and the other passengers disembarked, James had somehow vanished. His personal effects remained on the luggage rack and- Wait, so he just vanished during the ride or did he get off somewhere without anyone seeing? And on the seat next to him was an open bus timetable. So with all his fellow travelers swearing that they had not seen him move from the bus, how had James managed to disappear in full view of them all in between two stop off points? I don't know, maybe he did get off at one point or something like that. You know, if people are busy doing their own thing, people aren't that observant to see things going on around them. Like, have you seen the viral video on YouTube of like people playing basketball or whatever, or playing with a basketball, and then, then when they're doing it, like a monkey or a guy in an ape suit, whatever, walks by? And most of the time you don't see that guy because you're not focused on that. So it could be a similar situation where the guy could have just gone off, maybe no one would have noticed, you know? James Tedford was never seen or heard from again becoming yet another mystery of the Bennington Triangle. What's with the freaking sound effects? Man, that just kicked it up a whole nother lot, notch. Paul Jefferson. The fourth individual to vanish was eight-year-old Paul Jefferson on a- Eight or 80? October the 12th. The fourth individual to vanish was eight-year-old Paul Jefferson. Eight. The 12th, 1950. Paul's parents were farmers, and on the day he vanished, he was assisting his mother with her work on the farm. What's an eight-year-old expected to do to help on a farm? I mean, the kid's eight years old, not eighteen. They had driven down to feed their livestock in a pickup truck, which Paul had remained in whilst his mother went about her business. When his mother returned to the vehicle, Paul was no longer sitting inside, nor could he be seen or heard playing anywhere nearby. Strangely enough, just like Paula, Paul was wearing a bright red coat, rendering him highly visible amidst the green landscape. But despite search parties involving police, volunteers, and bloodhounds, Paul was never found. So the last person to see him alive was the mother? I don't know about you, but obviously that makes the mother a pretty big suspect. I don't want to say anything horrible, but maybe the mother, bleh, the kid for whatever reason. I mean, that kind of crap happens like every year. You hear this kind of crap happening in the news, so... Maybe she just said, oh, I, I went away, came back, and he was gone. And no one could ever find him because she knew that he wasn't actually missing. I don't know. That's just speculation. But, I mean, that's very possible. Definitely judging by how crazy some people can be. Legend has it that the dogs lost all trace of his scent at the same location that Paula Weldon was last seen along the long trail. Oh, really? That's weird. Locals consider it bad luck to wear red when walking the long trail. All right, we're going to end it here. Uh, there's one left. If you want to go watch it, make sure you go check out Top 5's video. But yeah, this was freaking uh, weird and uh, a little bit creepy. I don't know. It's weird that all those people went missing within a, such a short amount of time. And that people went missing around the same areas too. Which that makes me think that it might be a, like someone, you know, some crazy person in the woods kidnapping people maybe. Something like that. 
It's possible. You never know. Especially within a short amount of time. Like, if it was 20 years later, or 10 years later, I highly doubt it. But it was like a year or so later that, you know, a couple of the instances happened. So, it's possible. I don't know. Or, as I said, it's possible that the mother did something horrible to the kid and just said, oh, the kid vanished or whatever. I don't know. It's possible, but who knows? That was, what, 50 years ago or over 50? 60, 69 years ago. Almost 70 years ago. That's crazy. Anyway, I hope you guys liked this video. If you did, make sure you give it a thumbs up, possibly share it with a friend. If you're new, subscribe to the family. Also, make sure you guys go subscribe to Top 5s. I'm going to see you guys next time.